It's April 14, 1912, somewhere in the North Atlantic. You're aboard the ship, the Carpathia, and your captain has just retired for the evening along with the rest of your crew. You're left, and at midnight, stretching, you find an incoming message via Morse code. Now, Morse code is a series of dashes and dots, and each letter is separated from each other letter by a little bit of uh, silence. So here we get dot, um, dash, dot, dash, dot. Well, what is that? Well, that is C. You can look over on the left and you can see that that is the letter C. And the next is dash, dash, dot, dash. You can look down that list and you can see that that is Q. And you can see the last one, dash, dot, dot. That's D. So this first um, communication is CQD. What does that mean? That is a short form and it means all stations distress. The person who sent this message doesn't care who you are, they want to tell you that they're in trouble. The next is dot 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 dash 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 dot dot dot. That we're more familiar with. That is SOS, and that's the newfangled way of saying C CQD. Back in 1912, this transition was being made. Why was SOS uh, used? Does it mean save our souls? No, it's because of the pattern that's very easily recognizable. Dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. That is a, a pattern that you can recognize very quickly. And that's why SOS is used. So, someone's in trouble, and who is it? MGY. Who is MGY? MGY is the three-letter code for the Titanic. And you, aboard the Carpathia, receive this call. Here's the Titanic um, in happier times. The Titanic was 268 meters long and it cost 7.5 million dollars to complete in 1911. It took 3,000 men two years to build in Belfast, Northern Ireland. You can see the Titanic in the background here and coincidentally that's my hometown, that's where I was born. Here's her rudder 101 tons, just to give you an idea of the scale. Here's her turbine. And so you, aboard the Carpathia, cannot believe what you're seeing. You're seeing these bedraggled souls coming in from the Titanic. Here they are, um, coming up to the Carpathia. There's um, 1,517 dead after all of the bodies have been counted. Certainly one of the great maritime disasters in history. Not the greatest loss of life, but the thing that separates out the Titanic from um, even greater losses of life is that these were the elite people of society who were involved and many of whom died. And here's the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean. The radio communication sent out by the Titanic on that sad night is notable in that everybody was to be contacted. CQD, all stations distress. We want help from anybody who's listening out there. So, this is going to be a very different type of radio communication than what we're going to focus on in this talk. Why would you not want to let everybody know what you want in plain, simple, good Morse code? Well, the answer is war. Just two years after the Titanic disaster, we are at war. Your chums are fighting. Why aren't you? These images from the Library and Archives Canada. Go! It's your duty, lad. Join today. Don't wait. So, boys 
men joined in their thousands. This is them loading on to, in, to ships in Halifax Harbour and off to the front. A grim piece of France. Whenever you're in this kind of situation, you don't want your radio communication to go to everybody. You want it to be understood only by your friends, only by your allies. And that's true of the German side, and it's also true of the Allied side. Of course, the Allies want to try to break the German radio communication, and the Germans want to try to break ours. You stop your enemies from breaking into your secret radio communication by using codes or ciphers. Codes disguise words or phrases. So, for example, KGF. KCE might actually mean poison gas. And ciphers disguise letters, so Y might be substituted by K. In practice, uh, both sides used these together, codes and ciphers together. But we're going to focus just on ciphers in this talk. But let's look briefly at an example of a code just so you understand how it would work. So this would be a code book. We're going to look at one section of it. And let's say that you wanted to Morse code somebody that they are expecting an attack. So you might say expect attack, and we can look under there expect K G E and attack K E C. So you would then put those in and you would get the Morse code K G E K E C and you would Morse code that off to um, the person who is expecting attack. We're going to focus in on the ciphers. And the ciphers that the Germans used in the later part of the war came from a very ancient source. Now they honed this, they made it better, but at its core it came from Polybius in 200 BC. So we're going to learn the Polybius cipher. And Polybius used a square, and the Germans used the letters A, D, F, G, and X on this square. Let's see how it worked. So instead of using all of the letters available to them, they just used these five. Why these five? Because those five were confused least often by Morse code operators. So a Morse code oper operator very rarely made a mistake. Um, a D versus an F. Is that a D or an F? Oh, well, it's definitely a D. And um, so that, that was a good property in sending rapid Morse code messages. Let's see how this worked. Well, first of all, I need a volunteer out there in the audience. Thank you. I, what I want you to do is I want you to think of a word, any word. Fortune. Okay, let's put down fortune. So then we just write down, that'll be our secret code word for the Polybius square. So we write down fortune, and then in the next space, we're going to write down um, the next letter after E, so fortune end with E. So what's the next letter after E? Well, F has already been used in fortune, so we're not going to put an F there. Uh, G. So we're going to put G in the next space, and then we're just going to keep on going. G, H, and on. And you notice that I and J we put clump together because uh, those uh, we only have 25 slots and we've got 26 letters in our alphabet. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, now how does this work? How do we actually encode a little piece of message? Well let's say that this was the message that we wanted to, um, to understand what it means. Okay, X, D, A, G, A, G, X, D, X, G, F, A. So what does that mean? Well, to decode it, we clump the letters together in twos. So we get X and D. And what letter does X and D make? You notice the X is first and the D is second. Well, we look down the left side, X and D. And we look at the intersection of those two, 
and they intersect at A. So XD actually means A. AG T T A C K so A, A C K. So that um, Morse code actually read attack. Do you get it? Okay, so this was a Polybius square. How hard do you think it would be to decipher some cipher text made by a Polybius square if you didn't know the secret code word? So our secret code word, remember, was fortune. So if you didn't know fortune, but you knew that we that you were using a Polybius square because you can see all of these A D F G A D D A, you can see the in the incoming Morse code. You just have no idea um, immediately how to decipher it. How easy would it be to decipher that? Well, that's that's what you guys have to do now. Here is a Polybius square, some cipher text. You don't know the um, the code word, and you have to decipher this. So go ahead. You're hesitating, but you shouldn't. You should jump right in and seriously try to solve this. And one way to do it is to ask yourselves, is there no structure here at all? Are those letter combinations totally random? Is there no information in there at all? And I think you'll come to realize that, um, that there are things in there that, that make it look not totally random. And if you can sink your teeth into those, you will be able to make progress in solving it. But I will give you a hint. And this is the most important hint. What you will be doing is called frequency analysis in order to break this cipher. And your most important weapon is your knowledge of English, specifically your knowledge of letter frequency. And I'm going to help you by bringing it out even more. I'm going to tell you that E um, is the most common letter by far, then T, then A, and uh, drops off to Z. So you wouldn't expect too many Zs in, in this uh, ciphertext that you have to break. Less useful would be two-letter frequencies. So for example, in English, the most common two-letter combination is th, that, this, there, um, with. So all of these are to have the two-letter combination th. Probably less um, useful is going to be the two-letter, the same combination. So uh, double L's are the most common, then double E's and double S's. And word frequencies, again, probably because our cipher, um, our cipher text is quite short, uh, most of these words probably don't even appear once. So th these are just um, clues. The most important clue is the letter frequency, the first graph that you got. But using these four graphs, uh, solve this ciphertext. Stop now and solve it.